shalom, aloha, and shaloha. <laughs> I just love being back in Hawaii. Um, how many of you are just blessed that you live in Hawaii? Don't take it for granted. You live in a very beautiful place. And uh, we traveled all the way from Israel here. We're living in Jerusalem, for those of you that don't know us. And, uh, but we came from Maui. Maui is where our, our ministry was, is based and where we were started, where we got married, and where I actually became born again. So the Hawaiian Islands are very near and dear to my heart. And the Lord called us out of Maui and called us to Jerusalem. And many Israelis, when we moved to Israel, it was six and a half years ago. So when we moved to Israel, back then it was really crazy. Uh, terrorists were blowing themselves up on buses and in restaurants. And uh, Israelis would ask us, uh, where are you from? And we'd say, Maui, Hawaii. And they'd say, are you Jewish? And we'd say, no. And they'd say, are you crazy? <laughs> Why are you here? And uh, how many of you know when God calls you somewhere, and even though you don't understand it and you don't know how it's going to work, he has the perfect plan. He knows best. And God really used that because Israelis love Hawaii. They, one of the favorite shows that they watched when they were growing up, for the ones around my age, was Hawaii Five-0. And so even it was in black and white. And they loved it. And they, so in their hearts, it's always like, oh, Hawaii, I want to go to Hawaii. So God would really use that in a great way for the door to be opened for us to be able to share why are we in Israel. And we're in Israel because God called us there, called us there to share about their Messiah, who this Messiah is. He's the hope of Israel, and his name is Yeshua, whom we call Jesus. And he's their Messiah. And uh, God has been doing great things over the last six and a half years. We're there under a student visa. That's the only way we can stay because we're not Jewish. So we can't um, live in the land, uh, you know, make aliyah. So we, we have to be under a student visa, and God's provided that for us. And from Jerusalem, from Zion, we take the gospel out. So World Mission Outreach is to proclaim the gospel, to equip and to mobilize the church. So we bring teams from all over, from different nations, and then we go out and share the gospel, whether it be in Israel, and there we have to use a lot of wisdom because it's one-on-one -on -one evangelism, and we can't do any mass evangelism campaigns. And, uh, and then from there, we can go to, say, Thailand, where we did a big campaign in February where we mobilize the church, equip them and mobilize the Thai church to reach the many traveling Israelis that are coming to, Isra coming to Thailand every year. There's about 100,000 traveling Israelis that are coming to the Far East after they get out of the army. So in February, it took us two years up to get to this point to mobilize the church to get ready for an outreach that we did. And it was really exciting. You're a part of this church. Because we can't do this without you. This is one of our supporting churches through prayer and finances. So we just want to let you know what the Lord did in February. And that was that we were able to give out 5,000 bottles of water, 10,000 flyers, 200 posters to get Israelis to come to a banquet, a Purim feast, where they would be fed and they would hear the gospel presented in a Jewish context. And it was awesome. We didn't know how many the Lord was going to bring. You never know that until the last minute. Seventy Israelis came to this event, and seven gave their hearts to the Lord that night. They made a profession of faith. They put it in writing. They're getting follow-up back in Israel, and that is really exciting. And I just want to give God the glory for that because that is amazing what the Lord did. So thank you, Lord, for the seven uh, born again, and all the ones that heard the gospel for the first time. So it was really exciting. And uh, the Lord is moving in a very mighty way in Israel and in the Middle East. Many Muslims are getting saved. We work with Muslims also. We uh, took a team, brought a, two teams into Israel over the summer, and we ministered up north near the Lebanese border. We ministered in a Lebanese church, and uh, it was powerful because two of our team members, one was a born-again Jewish woman from Hilo, the other was a born-again Egyptian woman uh, that was an ex-Muslim 
that came to faith 25 years ago, and they both have very similar testimonies. And they got up and shared their testimony in a Lebanese church, and it was powerful to see a Jew and an Egyptian ministering together. Tell me that isn't, like, exciting. I was so excited about that. And then I want to share something else with you that really encouraged my heart. There's a woman in Israel that we met about when we first moved to Israel. Actually, she sold us our car. She's Israeli. She fell in love with us. We fell in love with her. And she would invite us to Shabbat dinners at her home. And she, we had shared the gospel with her. And she said, well, I want you to come to my house, and I want you to share with my whole family. She was a natural evangelism and she, evangelist, and she hadn't even come to the Lord herself. But what happened was we would go and we would share with her family, and, of course, her family wasn't really thrilled about all of that. Uh, but Sharona and, and Henry and I became very good friends, and over the course of, of the years, we've been ministering to her through fr- you know, being friends and just sharing, opening up the word and sharing with her prophecies that point to Yeshua as the Messiah. And last year, before we left Israel, she came to our house and she said, I want to put my faith in Yeshua. And so she prayed to receive the Lord. And this was so amazing. And so she's growing slowly in the Lord, but it's been my dream and my vision that Sharona would really um, get discipled really good. And she would come with us on some trips and be able to minister with us and share her testimony. And uh, please pray for her. Over the summer when we brought these teams in, Phoebe, who's also our good friend, who's the ex-Muslim, she was staying at our house, and I had told Sharona many, for many years all about Phoebe, how much I love Phoebe and how much they remind me of each other. So when I called Sharona, I said, you've got to come over. Phoebe's here. She's in Israel. You've got to come meet her. So she came to the house, and I really thought I was, like, the closest to heaven that I could get because when Sharona walked in the house, she said, where's Phoebe? And Phoebe was in the back room, and she said, I'm here, Sharona. And she came out, and they started speaking in Arabic to each other, and I was like, whoa. And Sharona, her family came from Iraq. They were Iraqi Jews. So Sharona's, one of her first languages was Arabic, because her grandmother spoke Arabic to her. So here's Sharona, this Israeli Jewish woman is speaking to Phoebe, who's an ex-Muslim from Egypt, and they're speaking in Arabic, and they're two of my very best friends, and it was awesome because Phoebe was able to actually share her testimony and how she came to faith, and I thought, wow, Lord, if we get these two women together preaching with us and sharing the gospel, how powerful is that going to be? I'm like, wow, you were a stranger in, in her land for 400 years, and now here you are in her land. It was just awesome. So please pray for them, and pray that Phoebe will be able to take more trips with us, because God uses her in a mighty way as an ex-Muslim. So God is doing great things all over the world. And real quick, I just want to share something with you, because in the first meeting, uh, I was looking at this palm tree. I was looking at both of these, and I was like, wow, I don't know if you know this, but this palm tree, the In Israel, our palms are not coconut palms. They're date palms, and they produce dates, of course. That's the fruit. And it's one of the seven species. And we know that when Jesus came, you know, they were waving the palm branches. But do you know how they have it make a natural V? Look at the palm tree. It makes a natural V, and it's a symbol of victory. And right now, we're... It's the feast, the high holy days in Israel. I miss Israel right now because it's a really awesome time to be in Israel because it's the feast time, the fall feast. And right now there's little booths that are set up all over Israel and because God commanded them that they need to um, worship him in these little in these little booths. So they make what is called sukkahs, and they everybody eats in them and worships God in them. And it's really awesome time of year to be there. And they decorate the sukkah, and they have palms. It's commanded. It's in the book of Leviticus, and you can read it later. It's uh, Leviticus 23. And so Feast of Tabernacles, which is coming up, I think it starts on Wednesday evening. For eight days, the Jews will be sitting and taking their meals in the sukkahs. And I'm talking even restaurants have sukkahs. So they're all over the city. And you see the palm branches. And anyway, the Lord was really speaking to me in the first meeting, and I just want to share this really quick with you because... It's so awesome, if I can just find it. Um, he shared with me about this palm tree. And it, he gave me First John 5, 4, and he said, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And verse 5, it says, Who is he that overcame the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 
And it's so awesome because Jesus is the only way. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And you can't get to heaven. You can't get to God the Father without him. You have to go through him. And we can't compromise that, right? That's the only truth. So Jews have to hear it. Muslims have to hear it. Buddhists have to hear it. Everybody has to hear it. So we thank God for the privilege to be able to serve him. And you can serve him right here. You can serve him to your neighbors and your friends. But everybody needs to hear the gospel. We heard about this tragedy that happened. I All I ask is, Lord, I... I don't know if they knew you, but I hope they did. I hope they're going to have eternal life. And that's my hope for everybody, and I know that's God's hope. So even during this feast time of um, really thinking about the feasts, and you can read about them in Leviticus 23, all the feasts, think about that someday Jesus will come back, and he will be dwelling with us. And um, that's our hope. Our hope is that we're born again, we believe in him, and um, one last thing really quick in John chapter 7. I just got to share this too because the Lord put it on my heart. Um, in fact, you can read it later. I really encourage you. Jesus was at this feast. Jesus kept, kept all the feasts. And when Jesus spoke at the, this last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, it was the eighth day. In John um, 7:37, he Jesus said, if any man thirst... Let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. No wonder the Pharisees and all the high priests and everybody couldn't stand him because he really um, got in their face with stuff. And this was when they were going to offer up the drink offerings on the eighth day of that feast, the high priest. And Jesus really confronted them with this. And so we know that Jesus is who he said he is. This is the word, and it's truth, and it's our foundation. And so God bless you. We love you. We thank you so much. See me at the table afterwards because I brought some goodies from Israel and also our prayer letter, some information on how to share your faith with Jewish people. Please pray for the Jews. They need Jesus just as much as everybody else needs Jesus. Thank you so much for your prayers. We need them. We love you. You finish? Yeah, wow, I thought you were preaching. <laughs> you can do how you can. She was preaching. I love it. She, I don't know if you saw that, but she was already preaching. I don't have to continue. I, I don't have to go there. You want to continue, honey? Are you sure? I want you to preach on that topic next year, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. I really enjoyed the, 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 the Tabernacles because I think this is a great teaching on the Tabernacles next week. On the Feast of Tabernacles, it's wonderful. It's on, right? Yeah. And that, uh, thank you very much. I really touched my heart by that. that there was, um, I think my heart was going on about Tabernacles Feast. And it's a wonderful teaching on the world yet to come. When Jesus from Jerusalem will bring peace to the whole world. And actually, we had a prelude. Tabernacle means Jesus from Jerusalem will reign the world. It's called the Messianic Kingdom. And this world we live in, that's not my message yet. Let's wait for my message. <laughs> this world to come, Jesus gave us a prelude. Jesus was here 40 days with the glorified body. After the rest from the dead, the God the Son in this glorified body cohabiting with 11 mortal bodies, disciples. And this immortal body, a fish with the mortal bodies for 40 days. For 40 days, Jesus came to the disciples. For 40 days after resurrection, Jesus went through the walls. So this earth has our experience. 40 days of the prelude yet to come in the future. If he can do it 40 days, he can do 100 years. He can do 1,000 years. So this will already experience a little bit of the tabernacle. It's powerful, huh? To know that God the Son was here already in the flesh with glorified bodies after the resurrection from the dead, giving the disciples a prelude of the world to come. So it's a different teaching. I know the seventh feast of Israel it goes back to feast number seven, Tabernacles, one of the seventh feast, and that uh, it's a great teaching. That maybe as a homework, you can go home today. You can really, really. I know you love homework. I hear people in Kailua love homework, <laughs> especially that man over there. Yeah, <clears throat> love homework. And really, Leviticus chapter twenty-three. It's a great book to read, and I would teach you the seventh feast. Right now, we are at the end of yesterday was the end of Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Yes, last night was the end of it. The, all the Jews broke all the fast. I went downtown in Honolulu last night. I drove by the Pali Highway. So all the bunch of Jewish people leaving the synagogue, Emmanuel Temple, leaving the temple. They confessed to God all the sins. 
they expected the name to be inscribed in the book of life in heaven. But there was no blood sacrifice. Everything was right. So one thing was missing. Moses says, Leviticus 17, 11, Moses says, without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission of sins. And that was missing last night with thousands of Jews all over the earth in synagogues. They broke the fast, asking God, on one day from Friday night to last night, asking God, Lord God, Avino Makeno, Avino Makeno, forgive our sins. And God said in John 3:16, for God so loved the world, he gave his son. I already have forgiven you, Israel. But the Jews said, no, we don't believe in the Messiah. But some of them said, yes, I believe in him. Some accepted the Messiah. Others don't accept the Messiah. God says, I already gave the forgiveness of sins from heaven. God's looking down from heaven. I already have forgiven you. Hey, look at the cross. All of you fasting down there. Look at the cross. My son, forgive your sins. It's an amazing world we live in these days. So because it's a different topic, let me get to my point now. <laughs> Maybe next year we'll continue on the seven feasts, my wife and I. Today I want to speak to you on something very simple. Something that you know about it, but we forget about it. Because sometimes we complicate it about it. And it's wonderful to have teaching, we need theology, we need anthropology, we need doctrines in the church. Yes, my brother, slow down. You told me that. <laughs> Give me the red car. Slow down, yes. <clears throat> I want to take this message. I can use it next time. So go on now. It's important to teach theology, anthropology, and doctrine in the church. Everything is important. But friends, what is theology? What is doctrines without the gospel of Jesus? Without the gospel, there is no theology. Without the gospel of Jesus, there is no doctrines. Without the death of Jesus and resurrection of Jesus, and the gospel and theology and, and doctrines for the church. So we have theologies. Pastor Tim is a great teacher. Uh, we were talking about issues like this. He teaches theology and, and doctrines. Everything is important. I believe that. I teach the same every year in churches around the world. But today, the Lord touched my heart to do something very different. Maybe because next week we're going to a conference. And so let's analyze this together, what's going on here in the next 10 days. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says... 15, 1 through 4. Theology and doctrines and conference are very important. It's very important to know the end time of the world, the end of Israel. Everything is important. God wants us to know all of this. But if we don't preach the gospel, if the gospel is not the center of everything, we miss everything. The gospel must be in the center of everything. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says to the church, he's speaking to the church, to the Corinthian church. I believe Paul is speaking to us today. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, and in which you stand, by which you also are saved, <clears throat> if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver, deliver for you, excuse me, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. That's very humble right there. He passed unto, uh, unto us that which he received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What a humble man, Paul. I want to analyze right now Paul's life. For him to say this is very humble. And I want to explain that. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, for this short time given to us. My Lord, I pray that you, God, Holy Spirit, flow through my heart to shine Jesus, God the Son. That you, God, be glorifying this message. And now everybody be touched this morning. Remove any spirit of warfare away from our minds, a whole by life, Jesus, spirit, minds, and bodies of our lives, away from this room. And we pray that every mind be captive, captivated by the word of God. And I thank you, Lord, that you be glorified. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father, for this day. Amen. So Paul here comes to the church. He actually is writing to the Corinthian church. and give a challenge. Uh, so let's analyze a little bit one by one, one verse at a time, what Paul is doing right here. To me, Paul is a very humble man, really. We don't know how he looked like. We got many theories how he looked like. Um, but he was a very humble man in the spirit, I think. Paul here gives to the church a challenge, which applies to our life today. This is what he's saying, in other words, in the whole context. This is what Paul is saying. Listen, church. 
Well, you, have, you have to mean what you say and to say what you mean to begin with. That's the gospel. So now he's speaking to us believers. We need to mean what we say and to say what we mean. That's what Paul is saying right here. Communication of the gospel is to mean what you say. And I mentioned the first service. I know we got some try with the neighbors, marriage problems. We got issues in our life with somebody else. And we're humble enough because Jesus is my Lord. We humble ourselves and say, I'm sorry. Like my wife and I, we got trials in a marriage. I humble myself and say, honey, I'm sorry. And she forgave me. Thanks God for that. Ten years in the marriage. I remember the first day we married, the first year, I said ten times a day, I said, I'm sorry. And she forgave me. Today, only once a day, I still say, I'm sorry. Still, one, once a day. Even today, I say, I'm sorry for tomorrow already. <laughs> I know how it goes. So, I said this because marriage reflects the gospel, too. So I had to be conscious of my marriage. You know, knowing the gospel, the preacher is also accountable behind the message. It goes both ways. So uh, now that uh, the, everything is clear about people, let's go to the message. I want to focus on the message here. <clears throat> Paul is saying this. is Communication of the gospel is to say what you mean to mean what you say. If we don't say what we mean, and if we don't mean what we say, we are not communicating the gospel. It's very important. We get to our spirit, that reality. If we don't say what we mean, and we don't mean what we say, we are not communicating the gospel. So what about the message of the gospel? Today is very simple, but it's profound. Because the gospel is simple, but it's very profound. We complicate it sometimes in the world, the gospel of Jesus. Sometimes we want to do apologetics to persuade people to believe. No, apologetics is great to do. Everything, like I said before, is important. But nothing convinced the heart of men except the Holy Spirit. Jesus saying, John, the gospel of John, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world. <laughs> That's his job, to convince the world, to convict your heart. See the finger? It convicts you, convince me. It's a conviction both ways. It convicts my heart and the world. Because I believe what Jesus is saying in Matthew 16. The cross is for the world to be saved from hell, but the cross is for believers to be saved from themselves. It goes both ways, salvation and lordship of believers every day. The lordship of Jesus in our thoughts, in the words, and in actions too. <clears throat> what about the message of the gospel? Well, it's very important what we say, how we do it. What we say to people out in the world and how we say it to people. So what we say and how we say it will determine eternity in people's life out there in the world. But also, how the person sees the gospel from us and how the person perceives the gospel from us will determine eternity in the lives of people other than in the world. Last night somebody jumped off the bridge, somebody says here. Maybe the person heard the gospel from someone us. How did he hear the gospel from us? What kind of message he got from us? Did he consider the gospel before he did the actions? I don't know. But see the implications of everything together? So important. Of the gospel of Jesus as the church born again. So how the person perceives and how the person acts toward the gospel will determine eternity other than the world. That's what Paul says that in his days. The message of the gospel was very crucial. The message of the gospel was very crucial in his time. Now, if Paul will be here today, he will say even twice as more. It's more crucial now than before. The gospel of Jesus. So the gospel is relevant to our spirits, our minds, our bodies, our social life. The gospel of Jesus changes life. Now, why? Why the gospel of Jesus changes life? Very simple. Como somebody says in Hebrew, yes, yes, pashut. Pashut means easy. Why the gospel changes life? Because there is no one like God the Son, Jesus. That's simple. There is no one like Jesus who changes the heart of people, who changes the minds of people, the attitude and the heart. So we need to prioritize the gospel. We must go back to the priority of the gospel. It's very important. The gospel is like an arrow, you know, like an arrow on the bow. I said before in the first sermon, you stretch the bow like this and you release the arrow. The arrow goes straight 
and the, and the front of the arrow is like a sharp point metal, penetrate. There's an arrow right here. At the end of the arrow, there are little feathers. The feathers navigate the arrow. The feathers is theology, the anthropology, and doctrines. Whatever in the Bible is written, theology and doctrines is the arrow. But the pointing sharp on the front is the gospel of Jesus. What is theology? What is anthropology? What is all this conference, which is good? I'm, I teach the same thing. I'm in time of Israel. But if the gospel is not on the front line. We can know the end times, but if we're not concerned for souls. What is the gospel in all of this? Didn't God say in Jonah, shouldn't I be concerned for Nineveh? The gospel being the first priority church in everything we do in the world or even in the church. We must prioritize the gospel again. And I know this church is doing it. That's why I'm encouraged you guys are doing it. I'm trying to reinforce a little bit more your heart. To encourage you guys to keep on doing it. You support the missionaries all over the earth. I see my wife and I there in the picture. Thanks God for you guys. You pray and support us. Uh, you're doing the gospel in Kailua too. And Kaneohe and the whole world. But there's something about the essence of the gospel. Not just to do it because I want to look good. Or to do it because the church is doing it. No. It's the personal conviction of the heart. It's a personal decision in the heart that we live the gospel and we shine because the gospel is not like something we have to do. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. My neighbors are Jews in Jerusalem. They check me out every day. <laughs> My next is a rabbi of a big synagogue in Jerusalem. I've been twice to the synagogues. Now we are better friends because he saw me there, unfortunately. Because, uh, because I went to see him, now he's my friend. And so Paul says, we need to prioritize the gospel again. And what is the gospel? I am sure you know what the gospel is, but we need to define it. It's the person and the work of the person. Who is the person? God the Son, who became flesh. And what's the work? He died on the cross for our sins. That's what Paul is saying here. I receive by grace. I pass unto you by grace. And that's the thing I want to analyze this morning. It's very humble when Paul says that. And what did he do? He died on the cross for our sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. Even Hebrews says the blood of Jesus cleanses our consciousness from dead works. So this morning, how is your conscience this morning? And he rose from the dead. He's alive today. And because Jesus is alive, he gives he give us life before the Father. There's nothing you can do or you cannot do to be right with God. No. Jesus makes me right before my Father. Jesus makes you right before the Father. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's Jesus, period. But in the world, sometimes it's Jesus plus comma. Something else you have to do. And that's a mix-up. The whole thing is called syncretism. And people get confused. And they feel guilty the whole time. Guilty. And they have to do to be right with God. No. There is nothing we can do to be right with God. Jesus makes me right before the Father. Jesus makes you right before the Father. If you assimilate the whole grace of God through Jesus in your heart. This is a responsibility. It's true toward the gospel of Jesus. And it's right. And God the Holy Spirit gave us the power to walk in obedience to the word of God. This is the standard God given us. His holiness and the word of God. Holy, 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 says the Lord in Isaiah 6. And Isaiah realized, whoa, this guy is holy. His holiness touches me to cleanse me from corruptions, from ungodliness, from worldliness. His holiness is my standard and the word of God. We measure our life in the light of the word of God. And through the word of God, ultimately to his nature, he's a holy God. His holiness should be the standard by which I measure my life up to every day. Which standard are you measuring your life up to every day? And so he's risen from the dead. And Jesus gave us life today before the Father. And verse 1 and 2, Paul says, he says, Paul says, For I deliver unto you. I deliver unto you, Paul says. I pass unto you the gospel. That which I received by grace, I deliver unto you. What a humble statement. Look, who was Paul? We all know who Paul was. He was a Jewish man. He was a Pharisee. He, he knew the Old Testament, the written word of God. He knew the oral law. He knew all the trans translation from in the rabbinical writings, Mishnah, Gemara, Talmud in those days. He knew Greek philosophy. He knew Anshabal, Plato, Aristotle. He knew all those Greek philosophers. And he could have taught about many things, which he did. 
He taught many things in the, in the New Testament. But right here to the Corinthian church, Paul is just, for a moment, Paul is putting everything aside. Paul preached on all topics, subjects. But for a moment, he put everything aside, and he told the church, church, let me tell you the most important subject. You need to be in, on the front line. He made right here simple, 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel. So he made it back to the gospel again. Let me tell you what's the most important subject the church has to be on the front line. What is the main message? So this is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians to us today also. Church, the church has a mission. Yeah, the church, the Corinthian church, you guys have a mission. And the same thing for us. We have a mission. And the mission is determined by the message. And our message determines the mission. What is your message of your life? That is your mission. <laughs> there are many messages, so many missions. But Paul is very clear here. The church has a mission. The mission is determined by the message, and our message is determined by the mission, which is the gospel of Jesus. God the Son, died on the cross from the, for our sins, rose from the dead, he is alive. When you give the gospel of Jesus, the Holy Spirit moved. That's his job of the Holy Spirit, to convince the heart of men of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. John 16, this is down 17, sorry. The Lord teaches that. So Paul is saying to the church, listen church, you have a, a mission. So we are in a search and rescue mission. That's what we are today. That's the front line of the church is. There's the discipleship training. Everything is important, like I said before. Discipleship training, equipment, proclaiming. But this is the priority of the church. On the front line with the gospel of Jesus. Conferences, end times, everything is important. But like I said before, what is conference? What is theology? What is doctrines if the gospel is not on the front line? We miss the point. That's Paul is saying right here. Because the church has a mission, which is a search and rescue mission. And I mentioned before in the first service, in Kandalulu, we have a great uh, United States services. You know, we got even the National Coast Guard. And I was saying in the first service, imagine the National Coast Guard. Sometimes they do exercises. They exercise way out in the ocean. And somebody fell off the boat in the middle of the night, got lost in the ocean. The next morning, they found out. What did they do the next day? They spent all manpower, thousands of dollars, airplanes, just to look for one soul. One person floating in the ocean, lost out in the ocean. It does our world. It is us with money. How much God gave his son from heaven who came to the oceans of the world to rescue all of us. And 2,000 years ago, God said to his son, Son, you go going to earth. You're going on such a rescue mission. And God became flesh. And Jesus says in the Gospels, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's me. That's you. All of us, he saved us from the ocean of the world, the ocean of sin, the ocean full of sharks, shark kind of sins, all these predators of sins, all kind of sins in the world is taken up, eating people's life to the death. Death, something man cannot comprehend. Only Jesus knows because he tested death on the cross. You have no idea the power of death. Because Jesus took it out of your heart on the cross if you're born again. People have no idea the reality of this gospel. It's so simple, yet so profound, so powerful. So that is what happened in the National Coast Guard. They guys spent all this manpower and money and everything. It's an example of how much more God from heaven gave up everything. He gave up everything from heaven for his son to become flesh. So he came to the world, and he did what he did on the cross. He rose from the dead. He went to heaven, and Jesus threw out the church. We born again. That's Paul saying to the Corinthians. You church, you have this grace. Paul says, and I repeat, for I give unto you, in verse 3, he says, I deliver unto you that which I receive. My goodness, Paul realized this grace which I receive, the grace and the love of God. I give unto you, and God took home to heaven. This grace is in your hands today. Before you go home to heaven, you pass it to somebody else in the world. So all they be born again. All they be safe. And the gospel continues to the whole world, to the Jew first and the Gentiles. So we are called to be a light with the gospel of Jesus. God has a conviction. God revealed to people Jesus. And I mentioned in the first service, I remember people having a hard time to know who Jesus is. When I get to the point, I develop a particular issue. But for now, I want to keep on the challenge right now to stay focused with this commission. 
Paul said, I deliver unto you. See, Paul, I mentioned before, he knew theology, anthropology. He knew Greek and Hebrew. He knew doctrines and theology. But for a moment, he knew Talmud, Mishnah, Gemara, all these Hebrew terminologies. And Paul put for a moment everything aside to get to the main point. Listen to what Paul says. I deliver unto you by grace that which I received by grace. Do you hear what Paul is saying? Grace, the grace of God. To give his son to the world. It's the, I cannot comprehend it right now. I cannot find different English words, Spanish or Hebrew words to define grace. It's something we don't deserve. But God loves us so much. He gave his only begotten son. Anybody who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Something we cannot comprehend because we're too busy on this earth paying bills. If we stay focused with eternity, we can share the gospel with people. Easy. But if our life gets cut out with temporal sins, you have a hard time to share the gospel. But if your heart is cut out with eternity, you have an easy time to share the gospel with people. Because you know who you are, you know where you're going. It's so clear, the gospel of Jesus. So we too, we are in a search and rescue mission. And the Lord through us wants us to bring this message to the world, the church. The question is this. Do people hear the gospel? Do people hear the gospel from you? How about your personal life? In the future, will people hear the gospel through you and from you? That's the challenge Paul is giving to the church right here. And that's the challenge for us today. But as we share the gospel over the earth, we all know the arguments. People always make arguments about Jesus. We live in Israel, oh my gosh, all these arguments we hear from the Jewish people, from Arabs, and it's challenging in the area of the world. Buddhists in the Far East, Hinduism in India, enemies in Africa, atheists in the West. And people make the arguments. In verse uh, 3 and 4 says, you know, that Jesus died for our sins. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And people make arguments. People say arguments. People says, oh, what's the big deal that he died on the cross? What's the big deal? And people says, in the day of Jesus, the Roman Empire killed many Jews on the cross. Many Gentiles died on the cross also. So what's the deal? Many Jews died on the cross during the Roman Empire. And it is true. Look at the Gospels. There were two thieves next to Jesus. Ha. Do you know their names? Nobody knows their names. That's the true statement. So it's the proof. There were many people who died on the cross, killed by the Romans. But my Bible says that among all those crosses in the Roman Empire, all those crosses, people hanging on the cross, there, that one. My Bible says the name is Jesus. That one has a name on the cross. And the Bible identifies Isaiah 53. He was supposed to die on the tree for our sins. Before he died, it was prophesied. And he did it to fulfill the scriptures. And my Bible says that among all those crosses, this one, that one in particular, the name is Jesus. And a name was given to him to die for me and die for you. And that's the beauty of this one particular one. The Bible says this one had a name. The name of Jesus, God the Son. The Son of God who died on the cross for the sins of the human race. And verse 4 says that Jesus was buried. Of course, the next argument. We all know that only dead people get to be buried. We bury only dead people under the grave. But Jesus was buried according to the Bible. It was written in Isaiah 53 verse 9. He was supposed to be buried. So Jesus fulfilled the scriptures. And that's the beauty of the Old Testament. Back up what the work Jesus was going to do. And verse 4 says that Jesus rose again. And we all know as a believer today. As a born again believers, we all know that you, if you're born again, you know in your heart that you cannot be a believer if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus as God, Son of God in your life. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, you cannot be a true believer. But because you believe in the resurrection, you are. Because Romans 1 4 says, the resurrection of Jesus is the crown of the gospel. It's the crown of the gospel. And this is the point, my friends. Of the world today. 
People having a hard time on this death and resurrection of Jesus. Even the Muslims, when we tell them that Jesus is God the Son in the flesh, they jump this high. And we have to be really careful in which country we are in, in the Middle East. Now in the West, they want to impose that he's not the Messiah. And how are we going to handle this? Compromise the gospel? So we need to pray for wisdom now and preach the gospel. Objectively, no names. We go to Egypt every year. And I remember, we went to, and this morning I spoke about one testimony of the policeman. Let me give a different testimony, a different one, testimony. I remember we went to uh, another town, outside Armenia. We always go to Cairo, preach the gospel in Egypt, once a year, we bring teams. We go to Cairo. And uh, after we preach the gospel in Cairo, we go south of Cairo, a town called Armenia. And I remember the day we were preaching the gospel inside the churches, you know, because it's illegal on the street. The Muslim minorities everywhere. They're being watched like a hawk. You need to be careful. And uh, so we are booked inside the churches. And believers bring unsaved friends, unsaved Muslims, unsaved Coptics by tradition. And we preach the gospel inside the church. And I remember one day we were tired. I told the team, let's go up for a boat ride. We got to an aisle. It's still wide. In the Moses days, it was huge. It was from here to... Maybe, who knows, beyond the Safeway supermarket. But now it's still wide, very wide. It's like a half mile, I think, away still today. The Nile. Not in Cairo, but in Armenia, in the center of the country. And we took a boat ride for two hours. And that, um, this little Arab guy, Muslim, with a turban on the head, took us into the boat. And we went way two hours in the, in the Nile River to enjoy it. After two hours, we finished uh, paying the money to this guy. And we went to go back to shore. And that, um, on, the, on, on the way back to, to the harbor, he went to the middle of the river. It's a little island over there. A little island. And I go, what's he doing? Why are we going to this little island? And we're so far away in the little island. There were workers, Egyptians working there in, in the field, working. And uh, so that we pulled over there, and, and an old man came out. It was an amazing experience. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. She's here. And... So the old man came out, and we didn't realize, and we were told he's the owner of the boat. The young man just drives the boat, get the money. But the owner was in the island. He's the owner of the boat. He came, and the young man jumped off the boat, get the money to him. I realized, ah, he's the owner. So somehow the Lord touched my heart, jumped on the land, on the land. so I jumped over into the island for just five minutes up to a prayer walk. I put a prayer walk, and my the whole team got nervous, I guess, they follow me. <laughs> they all left the boat, you know. And we walk into this island in five minutes. And my translator was telling me, this old man was behind us, following us, shouting Arabic, shouting. And my translator says, Henry, he's shouting. I said, what he's saying? He says, you are allied to Egypt. You are allied to Egypt. I go, wow. He's saying that? Yes, he's saying this. You are allied to Egypt. I don't know what the Lord showed him in the moment. All I know is, I knew in my heart, Matthew 16 was the plan right there. Matthew 16, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? See, this is the plan of the world. When people hear Jesus was God in the flesh, people have a hard time. Why? Because go against the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. This one guy in heaven. Here are Israel, our Lord God, God is one in heaven. How could this man be God in the flesh? So the Jewish people struggle with that. Even the Muslims have been struggling with that. But this man was shouting. So that concludes Matthew 16. Jesus came to Peter. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are a Tamashiach by Elohim. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And right away, Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal to you. But my Father who is in heaven revealed to you, I am God's Son in the flesh. So what happened to you? When you came to know Jesus, you responded to the gospel. You responded. But that day was the mercy, the grace, once again, of the Father to reveal to you, Jesus was God's Son in the flesh for you to believe in Him. And that day on the island in Egypt, the same concept, I turned around, and my translator turned around and said to him, Sir, what you see right now is Matthew 16. Right now, God in heaven wants to reveal to you Jesus, the Son of God. Do you want to know about this Jesus? He said, yes, I want to know about this Jesus. Who is he? I'm a believer in him. It was an amazing experience. That it really 
my, in human terminology, I cannot believe it. Human speaking, it's impossible to do this. Only God can do this. Only God save. And that day, we share the whole gospel that Jesus is God the Son. In fact, He was here 2,000 years ago. This Jesus who wanted to reveal to you today. He was here 2,000 years ago when He was two years old in the flesh. He was in Egypt for a few years when King Herod wants to kill Him. He went back to Israel. And then He did the work on the cross. Rose from the dead. Went to heaven. But from heaven, He wants to come to your heart today. He was here, but now He wants to come to your heart. He says, I want to know Him now. Now, He says, which is Akshaf in Hebrew. But he spoke in Arabic, of course, very similar to many languages. And right there we pray. Unbelievable. He prayed this most than 80 number of years old men. Accepted Jesus, the Son of God, into his heart right there in Egypt. And then when he says amen, I didn't realize that he's, he's like a, it's called the patriarchs in this area. We have patriarchs in the, in the Middle East still today, patriarchs. The father rule, you know. And then as he said, amen, one of his workers show up. He says, I want to know Jesus too. I heard about this Jesus just now. And this Muslim man accepted Jesus. And then another guy, Coptic, he says, I wasn't a member of the Coptic church in Egypt. I got tired of religion. I walk away, but I hear about this Jesus with you men. Can I come to know Jesus too? Three people accepted Jesus right there on the island that day. And then we get ready to my friend, of course, for the follow-up. Because Jesus fulfilled what he says. My Father in heaven revealed to you. I am God the Son in the flesh. That's the grace of God that Paul is speaking about right here. The grace which I receive unto you, I receive from the Lord. I pass unto you today. Share this grace with others. Let God do the job He has to do. He will do the conviction. He will open the eyes to see Jesus. We are just instruments in God's hands to share this gospel. This is the priority of the church, the gospel of Jesus. My friend, if the gospel of Jesus is not true, Nothing else matters in this world today. Go have fun, the world. But at this place, we are not country club. That's why this is a church today. To worship the living God. To give Him the glory. To be available to Him. To use us. To show the Son of God to the world. So church, we are not country club. We are a living organism. Given a great responsibility. Listen, God can use anybody. I'm amazed by that. I have an accent. You can tell. And that blows my mind. I can't even speak English very well. Seriously. Not even Spanish, my first language. My, my, and now Hebrew in my life. I'm just so humble to realize I can use anybody. I know in my heart I cannot preach this. I know I cannot speak this. I know it's impossible for me. Because I know I cannot. That's why I believe the calling of the Lord is Him when you are willing and available. Are you willing? Are you available? God is able to move through you to be a light of His Son Jesus to you. And all Kailua be born again. All these empty chairs, we're flooding with people. If you're available, just be available, willing. He's able to use you to shine His Son Jesus to the world. So if the gospel is true, the opposite is this. If the gospel is true, then it is the only thing. It's the only hope. It's the only anchor we have in the heart for eternity. So we must verbalize the mandate of the gospel of Jesus. To call people to repent of their sins and to respond to the gospel. Romans 10.9 teaches us the methodology, how to pray, how to invite people to come to know Jesus. Three approach. One, you share the gospel clear. And then clearly here is what you need to do. You tell people. Second, you give an invitation. Repent of your sins and come to faith to Jesus. Sir, give an invitation with confidence. My friend, if the people in the world hear you sharing the gospel, you have no confidence in the gospel. Oh, you want to know Jesus, but you know what? I have doubts. Uh, it's for you, but I'm not sure about me. They will see it. Share the gospel with confidence. People will see that what you preach, what you live in. What you believe is what you, you live. And you live what you believe. Listen, God, today we are many believers. All of our temptations, I know that. I got my temptations too. And there is no excuse for sin. That is for sure. If we sin, First John says, He forgive us our sins if we repent. But one thing for sure, we believe the word of God is God the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live what we believe in the word of God. Without Him, it's impossible. And that's why with confidence in the Holy Spirit given to us, we give invitation with confidence to people. Come to know Jesus. Give invitation with compelling. Why you need to know Jesus? 
And therefore, when we preach the gospel of Jesus, we proclaim Jesus as God. Hebrews 1.8 says that. The Father, God, said to the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever. The Father called the Son God. Hebrews 1.8. Philippians 2.8 also. We proclaim Jesus as God the Son from heaven who became flesh. 1 Peter 4.2 teaches that. Adam is from below. Jesus from above. Jesus took up upon himself the human flesh. 2.14 Hebrews teaches that. To redeem all of us. That's why Satan and the angels cannot be redeemed. Because Jesus did not take upon himself the body of angelic beings to redeem angelic beings. He took upon himself flesh and bones to redeem the human race, the image of God. You are so precious, friend. You are so valuable to God. You have no idea for what purpose you've been created in this world. And they come to know Jesus. I know you know Jesus. And I encourage you to be in Jesus. And to Jesus find the purposes our Father has for each one of us. Why he made you in this world. Through Jesus, everything is written in heaven for you to fulfill on this earth. It's wonderful that each one of us has the sign assignment by the Lord God on this earth. And you proclaim him who takes the death on the cross. You proclaim he is risen from the dead. You proclaim the need to give an invitation to people to repent. And then, of course, when you come to know Jesus, they will be encouraged to really walk in the Lord. There is a, a chart I want to share with you. What happened on the cross? On the cross, Jesus was punished so that we can be forgiven. And the world needs to hear that. On the cross, Jesus was made sin so that we can be the righteousness of God. And the world needs to hear that. On the cross, Jesus was rejected on the cross so that we could be accepted. And the world needs to hear that. On the cross, Jesus was cut off by death so we could join to God. And the world needs to hear that. On the cross, Jesus bore our shame. We can share so that we can share his glory. And the world needs to hear that. On the cross, Jesus was wounded for our sins so we can be healed according to, according to God's purposes. And the world needs to hear that. Jesus became poor on the cross so that we can share his abundances. And the world needs to hear that. Jesus became a curse on the cross so we can receive his blessings. And the world needs to hear that. Jesus died our death on the cross so that we can share his life. And the world needs to hear that. Life from death. The world is in death, which is sin, death, life out of death in Lord Jesus Christ. And this gospel is in your hands today. And Paul says, I pass unto you. I go to church, I'm going to heaven. I pass unto you. What I received by grace. Bye. He went to heaven. Now we're here. King of glory, throned in majesty, you are holy. You are holy Who can fathom All the riches Of your mercy Of your faithfulness You are worthy You are worthy Oh, for a thousand Does sing my great Redeemer's praise, the honors of His name. Awake my soul and celebrate the wonders of His grace. Let heaven and earth join in the song. Why don't we stand together? Who is like you, Lord of heaven, King of glory, throne in majesty? You are holy, you are holy. Who can fathom of the riches of your mercy, of your faithfulness? You are worthy, you are worthy.
Lifting me 